Dental Hygiene's update on COVID-19 for New York City healthcare providers. Uh, please note that you have been placed in listen-only mode as previously, so if you have questions during the presentation, please submit them via the Q&A portion of the WebEx, and we will address them as time allows. The slides from the webinar, as well as a recording of the event, will be made available on the provider page of our website by tomorrow afternoon. And additionally, we thank you for your participation in a brief final poll that will be issued during the last five minutes of today's webinar. Today, we're joined by Dr. Jane Zucker, Assistant Commissioner of the Bureau of Immunization at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and Dr. Mary Foote, Health Systems Planning and Strategies Lead for the agency's outbreak response. So with that, I will pass it off to Dr. Foot to begin. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Ali. We can go ahead and uh, go to the next slide. Um, well, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us um, after hopefully what was uh, a good summer for many of you, um, despite lots going on still. Um, but we are uh, very appreciative that you are able to spend uh, some of your Friday afternoon with us. So we'll just start with very quick uh, general updates on the current EPI situation in New York City specifically. And then we have the wonderful Dr. Zucker giving us um, all the latest on vaccines. And then I will be sharing some additional updates um, on monoclonal antibody therapy. Next slide. All right. So first wanted to start off with just a general uh, big picture update. Um, as you can see on top, we are currently what we would consider to be in a third wave uh, here in New York City where we have had a significant uptick in cases, but um, fortunately, um, thank you to vaccines and other great interventions, um, we are seem to be having less of an impact on hospitalizations in previous waves. Um, we are now starting to see a decrease in cases and hospitalizations, which we are um, hoping will be a sustained trend, and deaths, which were um, having a somewhat of an uptick, um, are holding steady, and there's usually about a two-week lag before we start to see um, decrease in death after cases go down, uh, so uh, we hope to uh, be able to see a change in that trend as well soon. Next slide. And then this is uh, just sort of a snapshot of the positivity rates going on within the city by zip code. Um, as you can see, uh, we do have some areas of significantly higher transmission closer to about 10% um, in parts of Staten Island uh, and Brooklyn in particular, and also have some uh, patchy hotspots in uh, Queens and particularly in the Bronx. So, um, you know, still still a lot to do in certain areas um, to help keep our community safe. Next slide. And this is just a quick snapshot of our variants that we've been observing. The variant epidemiology in New York City over the last four weeks. Um, really, Delta has completely devoured all the other uh, variants in terms of prevalence. So. Um, pretty much 98 to 99% of our uh, cases that have been sequenced over the last four weeks are uh, the Delta variant. Next slide. And that, with that very quick update, I am going to turn it over to the Venerable Dr. Jane Zucker uh, for our immunization updates for COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for uh, the introduction and uh, setting up the talk. I'm also happy to uh, be with everyone. I'm um, starting up the webinars again. A lot has been going on on the vaccine uh, front. So uh, let's uh, dive right into it. Next slide, please. So, right, so I think the this slide shows you where we were um, as of two days ago in terms of the total number of doses that were um, administered. And, and this is just really awesome. At some point um, yesterday, we actually would have crossed 11 million uh, vaccines having been administered in, in New York City. And we did cross the threshold of, which was one of our goals of 5 million uh, New Yorkers being fully vaccinated. Um, so if we look at the percent of adults, uh, residents vaccinated, we are up to 79%, which is great and 71% are fully vaccinated. 
Of course, if we look at just all residents and not all ages are yet eligible for a vaccine, uh, it is 67% of people have received at least one dose and 60% uh, of, of, this is all New Yorkers are fully vaccinated. Next slide. Um, so we are, uh, we continue to see differences in uh, vaccination coverage by race and ethnicity. This has been the same pattern that um, has been consistent throughout with coverage highest among Asian, uh, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander and Native American and Alaska Natives. Um, and then um, with Black New Yorkers having the uh, lowest coverage and then Hispanics and um, whites uh, sort of being in, in the middle um, and more or, or less um, in the same range. Next. Um, so these uh, just go over uh, the vaccine requirements um, in, in New York City. Um, and as of August 17th, people 12 years and older are required to show proof that they've received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. And this applies for indoor dining, indoor fitness, as well as indoor uh, entertainment. And we get a lot of questions about uh, what is proof of vaccination. And so, you know, I think it's important um, in terms of, I'm sure your patients uh, are, are asking if they're having, um, they've lost their card or they're not sure what the required proof is, but people can just actually show the paper CDC vaccination card. We are really encouraging people to take a photo with their phone of the vaccination card that will work as well. It will also work when they lose the card. Lots of New Yorkers have already lost their cards. It's much easier for us to help with a replacement record um, if they have the vaccination dates on hand. They can also show a photocopy. Um, and one clarification, we, we are not replacing CDC vaccination cards, but people can get an immunization record um, through the, the citywide immunization registry. We do have a My Vaccine uh, application where people can actually go online and obtain that record. They do uh, need to have a cell phone and or an email address in in the CIR, and that's something where providers can be helpful to actually get that information um, entered into the registry. So people could also show a record from outside the US, as long as it's a, a vaccine that's approved by WHO, um, and people can call 311 for assistance um, with obtaining a, a record if they need it. There's also a New York City COVID safe app. It essentially uploads an ID and it uploads a photo of the CDC vaccination card. Um, and then last there is the New York State Excelsior Pass. Um, there's sort of the pass and then there's a pass plus. Um, we, again, a lot of inquiries are for people who want this Excelsior Pass, but it is not required and it has a sort of higher standard of, of data. So um, we really are, are trying to get the message out that again, um, any of these other options work just as well for people to access these venues. Next. Um, so I think the other real big news over um, before Labor Day, we've gone one slide. Um, we have to go back one slide. So the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine did get full approval from, from FDA. Um, that was on August 31st. Its marketing name is um, Kamir Nati. Kamir Nati um, does not roll off the tongue easily. Um, but this is licensed for uh, it's 16 and older is the uh, the BLA um, for the product, but the vaccine continues to be available under emergency use authorization. And this is specifically for people who are 12 to 15 years of age and also for administration of that third dose to people who are um, severely or moderately you know, compromised. And I'll touch on that in uh, the next few slides. But one other question, the vaccine is essentially the same. The vaccine vial is the same. You can use the same vial uh, as an EUA vaccine for younger teens and uh, for older people. So there's really, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, no practical difference. And um, another uh, point that CDC has been uh, making very clearly is that the COVID-19 vaccination providers are responsible for adhering to all requirements that are outlined in the provider agreement. Um, and that includes that the vaccine should not be used off label now, uh, now that it is a licensed product. Uh, next slide. 
Um, so uh, what was also approved um, by by FDA in, in terms of amending the EUA for Pfizer and then uh, subsequent vote by ACIP is that a third dose of an mRNA vaccine um, is recommended for people who are you know, compromised. So uh, we're talking um, about people with moderate or severe immunosuppression, and I'll give you examples of what that of what that is. Um, and this is really to increase the immune response because many people, if they are um, moderately or severely you know, compromised, are not responding to the two doses and need that third dose. And just want to distinguish what we're talking about. A third dose this is different than a booster. And that's going to be the terminology of boosters. We're going to, if someone, for example, they have a complete two dose series and we end up recommending additional doses, those will be booster doses. More akin to someone completing a tetanus vaccine series and then getting a booster every, every 10 years. Next. Um, so uh, I think this is a, a really uh, important slide that was shown at the ACIP meeting. And this is showing um, the percent who were antibody positive after two doses of an mRNA vaccine um, by their immunocompromising condition. And I'll just go sort of left to right, um, but cancer patients in the lighter blue, which were um, solid um, organ tumors, actually responded um, well, well to the vaccine. Um, people who had hematologic cancers responded less well. Um, people who are on hemodialysis also responded well to the vaccine. Um, people who um, have had organ transplants um, do not respond as well. Um, and you can see the sort of scattering with um, you know, people really under 80% was sort of the, the exception. Um, and then people on immunosuppressive therapies, there's also a range, and it really depends on what immunosuppression you're on um, and what part of your um, immune system is, is sort of knocked out um, by the medication. So on the next slide, um, this shows what happened when they were when people um, who were immunocompromised were given a third dose. So they essentially took those people who were seronegative after the second dose and gave them a third dose. Um, and what was good is somewhere between a third to half of these people did have a good immune response um, and would have levels of antibodies that, that would be, you know, that were comparable, that would expect to be uh, protective. But um, the really important point, um, and uh, that I'll stress a bit later, is that this still means that uh, many of these patients do not respond even to a third dose. And so continuing to take precautions um, is going to be really important for them to prevent infection. Next. Um, so these are the examples of moderate to severe immunosuppression. CDC sort of says, think on the order of people who are transplant patients. And I won't go through this um, whole list, um, but this is available in the uh, CDC, uh, both in their clinical guidance. And the two documents, which are referenced at the bottom, are really quite helpful. Um, the CDC reference talks about immunocompetence. And then the IDSA policy statement um, gives you a, a really good roadmap um, for uh, how to really handle all vaccines in people who are, who are immunocompromised. Next. Um, and uh, so again, the, this third dose will be given 28 days after the second dose. If it's been, it doesn't matter what the interval is. So if someone had been vaccinated back in February, it's fine to give the third dose. Now, uh, we want preferably to use the same RNA vaccine, um, but that may not be possible uh, just where people have access to vaccination. And so the other vaccine can be given in that, in that setting. Um, but importantly, um, Additional doses are not yet authorized um, for immunocompromised people who received a J&J &J or Janssen vaccine. Those studies are ongoing, and I do expect that we will uh, have additional information, um, you know, probably coming this month um, or October. Next. Um, so I just want to turn to uh, talk about vaccines for the COVID vaccines for people who are pregnant, nursing, or trying to become pregnant. 
Um, so there have just been a number of just much stronger recommendations coming from CDC, coming from American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine. Everyone's strongly recommending COVID-19 vaccine, um, again, for, for this group of individuals. There is just an increasing amount of safety and effectiveness data of COVID-19 vaccination during pregnancy. So vSafe, uh, which was the app that people were asked to record um, their uh, immediate side effects after vaccination and people were followed. They, anyone who was pregnant was put into this registry. Um, they have shown that there's no increased risk for miscarriage uh, among people who received an mRNA vaccine before 20 weeks of pregnancy. And there are also three other safety monitoring systems that have not shown um, any signals or concerns for people vaccinated late in pregnancy. And there is data, there was a recent publication showing 96-97% um, vaccine effectiveness in um, people who are pregnant. And so the benefits of vaccination clearly outweigh um, any, really there are no known, but any potential uh, risks of people being vaccinated. Next. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, and, and part of the reason why we want to stress that today is that there is low COVID-19 vaccine uptake among people who are pregnant. So only about 25% of people have gotten at least one dose of a COVID vaccine, and this was um, as of last week. Um, and especially with the increased circulation of the Delta variant, and we know there's an increased risk of severe illness and pregnancy complications if a pregnant person gets COVID infection, it's just really important um, and urgent to get this population vaccinated. Um, there's a lot of misinformation um, about uh, vaccination um, just in, in terms of in that sort of reproductive health space, um, one common one we hear are concerns about um, infertility um, based on a misconception that the antibodies that are produced by the vaccine um, will actually a attack proteins that are in the placenta. That is definitely not true. Um, but this is an example of, of some of the um, common um, concerns. But again, there have been plenty of pregnancies that have been followed up in the vaccine trials, and I think there's enough data on safety that we can really reassure these patients. Next. Um, so I want to um, just talk about COVID-19 illness after vaccination, just for sort of some level setting, right? The vaccines are over 90% um, effective. So that means that you expect some people to get breakthrough infections, right? They're unfortunately not 100% effective. So um, what we do know about people who were vaccinated and um, have a breakthrough infection is that one, they have less severe symptoms, they are less likely to be hospitalized or die, and they are less likely to develop long COVID um, symptoms um, if they get infected. Um, people with breakthrough infections may be contagious, and so um, these people should still take the same precautions to prevent transmission. Um, if they uh, do test positive or, or have symptoms. Next. Um, and so what we do know again is, um, you know, people, you know, we hear, well, there are breakthroughs, vaccine doesn't work, but this vaccine, all the three vaccines that are available in the US work and they work really well. And um, they, we, you know, when we look at the curve that Dr. Foote showed that Third wave is not nearly as high as the first two waves. Um, again, likely, you know, due to vaccination and vaccines are protecting New Yorkers against infection and illness. If we look at um, the infection since mid-January, unvaccinated persons are making up over 96% of the cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. So again, vaccination is really imperative. And although we, again, we've seen breakthrough infections increase, you know, the severe disease is in the unvaccinated and unvaccinated people have three times higher rate of becoming a case and almost 10 times more likely of being hospitalized. Um, so again, the, the vaccines are working, you know, very well. And actually, you know, if you think about where we were 18 months ago, we would, um, you know, the, the vaccine is sort of really working better than we would have predicted or better than we would have hoped um, for getting a vaccine that as quickly as we did. Um, so the vaccines are working. Next. Um, so uh, th these maps, um, the map on the left is showing you hospitalizations per 100,000. The darker areas um, have dark have higher hospitalization rates and the map on the 
right are New York City adults fully vaccinated. The lighter areas have lower vaccination. And you know the bottom line that we're showing is, is sort of if you overlay those maps, that areas that have higher vaccination have lower hospitalization, just additional evidence supporting the value of vaccination. Next. Um, so uh, just also a word about co-administration. You can give COVID-19 vaccine with any other other vaccine, including the live virus vaccines, um, there's no, these are not live vaccines, so there's no interval uh, between other vaccines. Um, so um, you know, use that opportunity and it just applies for all ages. And I think it's particularly important, uh, especially if we think about the teens, many children have fallen behind on their immunizations during, during their pandemic. They may be coming in for their, um, the vaccines that they need for school, other vaccines that they're behind on. So it's an opportunity to give adolescents um, their COVID vaccine, as well as Tdap and meningococcal, and also if they missed um, an HPV vaccine. Um, and also we are coming on, you know, flu vaccination season has started. And so, you know, it would be a missed opportunity if both flu and COVID vaccines were not given at the same time. It is absolutely fine to do so and, and recommend it. Next. Um, so this is, I, I would say, um, again, another one of the sort of common reasons we're hearing about why people don't don't want to be vaccinated. They say, well, I already had um, COVID-19 infection. Why, why should I get vaccinated? I'm protected. But there are benefits of vaccination uh, for, uh, for these individuals. So again, vaccination is associated with a decreased risk of, of reinfection. That is, if you had prior COVID is as well, and there's some data on that now also, that um, your risk of sort of getting infected is less after vaccination than after natural infection. Um, vaccination does boost the immune response in people with prior infection, and you're getting sort of, it helps to boost um, the sort of memory cells and, and um, is raising antibody levels. It also gives us sort of more clonal sort of antibody response for more protection. So vaccination, you know, may be offering better protection against the variants. Um, and people who are recovering from COVID-19 can be vaccinated as soon as they meet criteria to discontinue their isolation. Next. Um, so uh, this is a, another really important message. We hear this a, a lot as well, that um, do not do tests for antibodies to decide whether someone should get vaccinated. Um, serologic testing is not recommended if someone has not been vaccinated, you should just vaccinate them. Um, you know, there's a lot we don't know about antibodies or different antibody tests out there that are measuring different um, different parts of the immune response. The, you know, there's no standardization across uh, the serology tests. And we don't want people thinking that just because they have a positive test that they can take fewer precautions. And these antibody tests have not been you know, evaluated or authorized by FDA, and they have not been validated. You know, we don't have a, a correlate of immunity either to know, as we do, for example, with measles, having this tighter, you know, this test at this level, we know you're protected. We don't have that for, for COVID-19. So, um, you know, don't get serology. Don't get serology after you vaccinate someone to see whether or not they had an immune response. Um, you know, complete their, their two dose um, series. The, the antibody tests, again, have not been approved or validated for testing for uh, response to vaccination. Next. Um, so I want to uh, touch on the importance of vaccinating adolescents. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, I get this a lot as well. You know, well, children or adolescents don't get a severe disease. Why, you know, why should we vaccinate them? Uh, but as we all know, cases of COVID-19 are increasing among children, especially uh, with the more transmissible Delta variant. Um, children are now making up more than a quarter of all cases that are reported in the U.S. And um, although COVID-19 may be milder in, in children compared to adults, children do still to be in develop severe infections. They require hospitalizations. They have the risk of multi-system inflammatory disease and, and long COVID. And you're not gonna know which of that child in front of you is gonna be at risk for complications. And you can prevent this uh, by vaccinating them. Um, importantly, vaccination is gonna help prevent and reduce the spread of COVID-19, decrease emergence of, of other variants. 
and um, help protect the community. Lots of articles documenting, uh, you know, younger, you know, teens getting infected and bringing vaccine back into the household and, and infecting, um, you know, older adults who risk of, of complications. Next. Um, also, I will say um, that with adolescents going back to in-person learning, it's also important to, you know, vaccinate them as well. Um, getting them vaccinated. School is starting next week, but it's a good time again, make sure they're up to date on their school immunizations, um, other recommended vaccines, and get their vaccines to be uh, protected when they are in class. Um, just a word about consent for minors. So there has to be consent for children 12 to uh, 17 to be vaccinated. Um, this can be in person, it could be over the phone. Um, some of our city run sites and additional providers, especially if you have vaccine and these are your patients, you can take consent in writing. Um, the, the person who's bringing the child does not have to show proof that they're the child's parent or guardian. Um, but so that's for um, in terms of consent, but in, in terms of having an adult present, children 12 to 15 do need a parent or guardian or another designated adult with them at the vaccination site. There is an exception for the school-based health centers um, that are providing vaccination on site. And there is proof of age, but um, if a child doesn't have an ID, the adult who's with them just needs to attest to their age. So the proof of age um, should not be a barrier to vaccination. Next. Um, so a lot, it's gonna be a wild September, a lot of developments um, in the works. So uh, Moderna has applied for full FDA approval of their product, it would be for 18 plus. Um, it's all, all the paperwork is here. So I think it will be before the end, end of the year, probably. Um, sooner, I would expect it sooner. And then Moderna um, has applied to FDA. This was back in June and we're, we're waiting um, for them to extend their EUA to adolescents down to age 12. Um, both Pfizer and Moderna are conducting studies in children less than 12. And both of the companies have submitted data to support booster doses. Um, FDA is meeting on September 17th to look at some of this data. Um, we'll see what the agenda is, whether they're going to look at Pfizer or Moderna or, or just um, based on media reports, they may only be looking at a Pfizer booster first, um, but this would then be followed by an ACIP meeting for recommendations if they do um, amend the licensure to allow for boosters. Next. Um, so again, FDA has not authorized the boosters. Um, and I, I mean, I would just uh, say, right, you know, directly, right, the media has been quite confusing about like the different messages we're hearing. Um, as soon as we, we have concrete recommendations, we will make sure to push that out to the provider community. Um, I think ACIP on August 30th really laid out a nice framework for how to determine whether boosters are needed. And that was looking at vaccine effectiveness. Is, do, are we seeing waning um, of immunity over time? Um, is vaccine efficacy, effectiveness reduced for the Delta variant? You know, it could be that some populations need a booster dose and others don't. And then also we, of course, want to make sure that the booster doses are safe and they're also immunogenic. Next. Um, so this is somewhat of a busy slide also um, from ACIP, um, but this is looking at vaccine effectiveness since introduction of Delta, which is important, and it looks at um, any infection, symptomatic infection, hospitalization, and severe disease. And the different um, vaccine series are in the different colors shown in the legend. And I just want to go first left to right. And just so that in the face of Delta, all the vaccines remain effective at preventing severe disease, right? Preventing hospitalization and severe disease, right? In symptomatic infection, um, the Pfizer vaccine um, is showing less vaccine uh, effectiveness and also less vaccine effectiveness against um, any infection. Um, although again, for Moderna, um, you know, we are seeing continued um, protection, good VE against, against infection. Um, so there's lots of reasons why, why this may be happening. And I will just say it's very difficult to tease apart what's happening. Like, is this waning over time? 
Um, is it actually that the vaccines are less effective against the Delta variant, again, effective against severe disease? Um, so had we had Delta variant in January, would we see the same pattern? We don't know. And also just to say at the same time that all this was happening, a lot of countries, and I will say Israel at the same time that they were, um, they had they were getting Pfizer and they were reporting a lower vaccine effic effectiveness. They were also taking, you know, the mask mandates and other um, mitigation measures were also relaxed. So there was a, a third thing sort of happening at, at the same time with, again, making this data difficult to interpret. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so just want to implore you to please take every opportunity to vaccinate your patients. Um, this is standard. We recommend this for all vaccines, certainly flu vaccine coming up. Ask about vaccination status of your patients at every encounter and document that in your, in your medical record. Hopefully your medical record is connected to the citywide immunization registry so you could um, look up your, your patient as well. Um, if you have vaccination on site, you know, vaccinate them at that visit. If you're not carrying vaccine, refer them to another facility for vaccination. Um, and again, we're not concerned about wastage now. Um, I still get these questions. If you have a multi-dose vial and you have one patient who wants to be vaccinated, open that vial up and uh, make sure to get them vaccinated. Next. Um, so this is um, just a word about an, a commissioner's advisory that went out this week. And this is really urging providers to offer vaccination information to all uh, of your unvaccinated patients at every visit. I think the really good news is that it is um, also accompanied by a new program that we've uh, announced this week to compensate providers for conducting outreach to unvaccinated patients. Um, and you'll hear more about um, the advisory and about the uh, this compensation plan. Um, there are frequently asked questions and a toolkit on our website, and there is a webinar uh, next week on the 17th um, that I would encourage you to join. Next. Um, and uh, again, your patients listen to you. All studies across all vaccines show that a strong recommendation from a person's medical provider is what sort of helps tip that scale for patients to choose to get vaccinated. Um, start those conversations with your patients, with uh, parents of teens to address their concerns. Um, and we can remind everyone COVID-19 vaccines are available for everyone. There's no cost and there's no concern about immigration status. We have lots of great resources on communicating with your patients um, at the website given um, on the slide. Next. Um, and then here are uh, some resources. Really, uh, COVID-19 vaccines are available really widely throughout the city at many different um, facility types, including pharmacies, federally qualified health centers, hospitals, we have lots of mobile sites, vaccination events, school-based health centers. Um, with back to school next week, um, schools that have uh, students that are 12 and older will have vaccination clinics next week as well. Um, there's also the Vaccine Finder website, um, in-home vaccination options for people. And there's a dedicated line for providers and staff to make appointments for your patients. Um, and then you can also uh, refer a patient for a vaccine appointment. Um, by filling out a short request form. So there's a lot, lots of opportunities. Next. And I'm going to turn it over uh, back to Dr. Foote to give us an update on monoclonal antibody treatment. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Zucker. That was informative as always. A lot of really good and very important information in there. And we have some uh, good questions come up in the Q&A box that we'll get to when I'm finished. So next slide. Okay, so just wanted to start with a brief kind of snapshot of where we are in terms of what are the available therapeutics for COVID-19, different phases of infection, um, starting from no illness, um, which is of course, uh, ideally vaccines will get us there, and um, to now exposure, uh, before developing infection, we now have um, an option that we will be talking about with monoclonal antibodies. Um, and then also we'll be focusing on the early symptomatic uh, phase. So we'll be focusing on the left side of this um, infographic today. Next slide. So 
you know, I think it's always good to review the rationale for the, the so what question of why, why should I be offering this therapy to our patients? So one is that we know, and there's good data to say that delayed production of neutralizing antibodies uh, has been shown to be correlated with fatal COVID-19. Um, and, you know, there's there's been additional data recently using monoclonal antibodies in hospitalized patients that show, you know, there is an impact on mortality for patients that were antibody negative uh, and COVID positive when they came in. Um, so so the data is, is is starting to really support this more and more. And monoclonal antibodies, as you know, we know as treatment, it can, you know, both keep symptoms from getting worse and shorten the duration of symptoms, but more importantly, um, you know, now we have clinical trial data as well as real world data that shows us um, that it leads to a lower risk of hospitalization and death by 70 to 85 percent. Um, and as post exposure prophylaxis now, we know they can reduce the risk of um, developing both symptomatic and also uh, asymptomatic infection. And, you know, those are kind of our most important, high, most important priorities to, you know, reduce morbidity and mortality, but also, you know, in times of, uh, you know, significant strain on the healthcare system, monoclonal antibodies are uh, certainly an important tool on reducing strain on the hospitals. And of course, um, at this point, monoclonal antibodies are recommended for use by both the National Institutes of Health COVID Treatment Guidelines and the Infectious Disease Society of America uh, Treatment Guidelines. And, um, you know, they really are, you know, I would say considered standard of care for uh, mild to moderate COVID um, pre-hospitalization at this point for high-risk patients. Next slide. And just a quick review uh, of monoclonal antibody products in use. There have been, um, you know, some, some changes and evolution uh, recently. So we have, um, of course, Regen Cove, um, otherwise known as Regeneron, which is the combination of Casarivimab and Indevimab. Um, so this was uh, recently had an update to the e emergency youth authorization um, to authorize its use as post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, Sirogen Cove is the only um, of the therapies approved, authorized, sorry, um, for that indication. Um, and the EUA was also updated um, to say that Regen Cove specifically can be given by either IV infusion or sub subcutaneous injection. Um, and it's considered uh, equivalent route of administration for post-exposure prophylaxis. But in the EUA, they do uh, note that infusion is the preferred route of tr for uh, treatment um, of symptomatic confirmed patients. Um, but sub subcutaneous administration can be considered, um, particularly if um, you know waiting for infusion would cause a significant delay in care. Um, so this is certainly uh, an option that we now have for, you know, outpatient treatment sites in particular to, to expand treatment. Um, Bamlanivimab etacetamab, which is an Eli Lilly product, that had actually, uh, you may have heard, that was actually, um, the EUA was temporarily uh, restricting usage in the United States due to uh, prevalence of some resistant variants, specifically beta and gamma, that were resistant to this product. But um, just last week, the national pause was lifted and distribution and uh, use is now uh, reauthorized for this product. So for those that had uh, product, this product, um, you know, still on hand at their facilities, um, it is now uh, authorized to use again uh, because it is effective against the Delta variant, which is the dominant strain variant at this point, which we'll talk a little bit more about. And then finally, we have a new product. Um, since the last time we spoke, which is citrovimab, um, and that is a uh, mono, monotherapy, so just one, one monoclonal antibody as opposed to the cocktail in the other two products. And um, just really the important thing to note with this product is that it is not being distributed for free as part of the federal distribution program, um, but it is available commercially, so you can order it, you know, similar to any other commercially available medication um, for uh, administration of patients. And uh, we've covered this before, but it's um, generally given as a one-time IV infusion or now uh, as a subcutaneous injection in the cases we talked about. 
Um, depending on the product, the infusion time can be 15 to 60 minutes, um, but for all products and both routes of administration, it requires a 60 minute observation time after um, the product has been given. Uh, and that's just to monitor for uh, some uh, acute reactions. And for treatment, it just, again, really emphasizing time is of the essence. It's most effective when given as quickly as possible after symptom onset. Um, and effectiveness goes down um, over time after a symptom onset. Um, but within the EUA, it must be given within at least 10 days um, after symptoms develop. And uh, if this can be administered both in the outpatient or hospital settings. Next slide. And so uh, one other thing, another important um, update is that, um, you know, previously the eligibility criteria were pretty uh, prescribed and specific for what high risk conditions um, will qualify somebody, but that has been changed for all of the products now. Um, there's been a significant expansion of eligibility. So um, essentially the bare minimum the patient must have um, for the use of treatment um, of infection uh, the patient must have mild to moderate symptoms and not be hospitalized. Uh, they must have a positive confirmed COVID-19 uh, diagnosis, and that's either through uh, a molecular test or an antigen test. Um, and the patient must be 12 years of age or older, and um, there is a weight minimum of 88 pounds. So um, if they fit those criteria, um, it's much more the clinician's discretion as to who they would consider high risk within um, you know, this, their patient population. Um, so, you know, they can really consider, you know, medical comorbidities in their decision making that would put them at high risk. But also, I think most uh, importantly, they can also take into account um, certain social um, uh, kind of physical or social factors that may also impact their risk. So, for example, um, we would consider people with disabilities at higher risk, um, potentially for severe COVID, um, people in certain congregate settings, certainly at higher risk, um, certain um, racial and ethnic groups have also been shown to be um, more at risk for severe disease. So those are other factors that you can take into account with your decision making and recommendations for this product. Next slide. And so this is um, just a few, I encourage you to take a look at the EUA fact sheets if you have not, and the links will be in the slides um, just to review. So these are just an example of, um, you know, kind of some of the, the highest risk conditions for severe COVID. Um, but again, um, just really want to emphasize that, that there is um, a lot of discretion um, for your decision making on, on what you would consider high risk. So this is not, um, these are not the limited conditions to what you can prescribe, but just uh, some examples. Next slide. And then, so this is the new indication um, that uh, is part of the uh, updated Regeneron authorization um, that it can be now used for post exposure prophylaxis. So, um, so this is again for people meeting the same criteria in terms of age and weight. Um, and this is for patients who are, again, in that high risk for progressing to severe COVID-19. Um, but the important thing is, um, so you really want to focus on patients that are, you know, high risk and exposed and either have not completed full vaccination or those that have completed full vaccination but are not expected to mount an adequate immune response. So in particular, basically, I would, I would kind of consider this the same um, you know, risk profile as the um, groups that they would recommend for that um, third dose of um, mRNA vaccine. So people that are have immune compromising underlying condition on immunosuppressive medications um, or, you know, dialysis um, patients on, on hemodialysis or some of the kind of the big categories. Um, but I basically I would just refer to um, the recommendations for that third dose of COVID and it's it's a similar group here. Um, and this can be uh, used as post-exposure prophylaxis in these kind of higher risk patients that have had a known exposure to an individual with COVID. Or, um, you know, when we're talking about institutional settings, um, you know, if somebody may not have had a, you know, absolute known 
exposure, but may be at high risk for an exposure due to ongoing um, transmission within an institutional or residential setting, um, such as at shelters, uh, correctional facilities, or nursing homes. Uh, it can certainly be considered in um, these cases as well. Uh, and then, uh, you know, if you are do have a patient that fits this criteria, um, you can give post-exposure prophylaxis dose um, you know, at a certain point, but if there is ongoing risk um, after four weeks, um, the doses uh, can be continued to be given um, at every four weeks as long as the risk continues, uh, but the subsequent doses um, would only be half of the uh, initial dose. So just, um, you know, you can check the EUA for the dosing recommendations on that. And then uh, this authorization was based on um, a really rigorous uh, trial that um, was a phase three randomized double, double blind placebo control trial with 1500 participants. Um, and in this uh, trial, they basically were providing post exposure prophylaxis um, through subcutaneous injection of Regen Cove um, to asymptomatic contacts um, that were exposed to a household member um, who had tested positive uh, for COVID-19. So, you know, household members, of course, are high risk for um, developing uh, infection. And, um, and uh, everybody that participated um, in the analysis that were included in the analysis uh, had a confirmed negative antibody and PCR at, uh, at onset of their trial, of, the tri of their participation. So the punchline is the links of uh, symptoms was reduced from uh, 3.2 weeks uh, to 1.2 weeks. So a significant reduction in the duration of symptoms for those that did end up um, developing infections, but uh, there was a uh, reduction in the risk of developing a symptomatic COVID-19 infection in, this, in the treatment group by 81.4%. Um, and that's symptomatic infection, but even, um, the risk of developing any infection, meaning asymptomatic, but they had positive PCR test, um, that risk was reduced um, by 66%. So um, really uh, impressive data. And, and that was, again, just to emphasize the subcutaneous administration route um, that led to its uh, inclusion in the uh, EUA for this indication. Next slide. And so this is just uh, a look at the Kaplan-Meier curve um, of the study participants, the placebo versus Regen Cove group. Um, and you will just see that the uh, odds ratio for developing symptomatic infection um, in the treatment group was 0.17, and that was statistically significant um, with a relative risk reduction, again, in symptomatic infection of 81.4%. So next slide. And then looking at COVID-19 vaccination, we of course still get a lot of great questions about, you know, what are the implications of vaccination for monoclonal antibody therapy? So if uh, you have a patient that has received monoclonal antibody therapy, um, you can still certainly vaccinate them, but the recommendation is to wait 90 days after having received the monoclonal antibody therapy. Um, to uh, start the vaccination series or complete the vaccination series. And if you have, you know, another common question that we get is if somebody is fully vaccinated and develops COVID, um, do they, is this a group that we would offer uh, monoclonal antibodies to? And um, basically the recommendation is if they are fit, um, otherwise fit the eligibility criteria, are high risk, have a symptomatic infection and test positive, um, the risk versus benefit uh, ratio is still supports offering the treatment. Next slide. And so for, um, you know, just, just to review the impact of COVID variants, um, SARS-CoV-2 variants on um, the efficacy of this therapy. So um, just in short, bamlanivimab, etacetimab, we kind of touched on um, the fact that they, this is product is not active against some of the variants, particularly the gamma and the beta. Um, but a newly released update to the EUA, um, as you'll see in this figure, um, has shown that there is uh, no imp impact on activity um, by the Delta variant. So um, the bamlanivimab etacetimab product is uh, active against the main um, strain 
variant of um, Delta, but there are um, a couple of subvariants, sublineages um, that may be resistant that are uh, being monitored very closely. Um, but so far, we have not um, seen an impact of the resistant um, uh, variants in New York City for the Delta. And then looking at um, Regeneron and Citrovimab, uh, according to their um, lab-based testing, they're likely to retain activity against all the known circulating variants of concern, and that includes Delta. Next slide. And this is just uh, showing you, again, since all the um, products are active against the Delta strain. And right now, the epidemiology in New York City, 99% of our sequent variant sequence uh, samples are Delta virus. So um, we are okay to use any of the three uh, currently authorized products. Next slide. And then just to remind you, how do you refer patients for monoclonal antibody treatment? Um, I encourage you to take a look at the heightsite.org address, um, which has information on treatment sites throughout the city and how to refer your patients, and uh, some of which do allow patient self-referral. Um, and also uh, New York City Health and Hospital has treatment sites in all five boroughs now. Um, and in Staten Island through a partnership um, with uh, Richmond University. Um, so you can have a one, one, one portal of entry through the Express Care or their um, COVID-19 phone number to uh, access, basically screen your patients for eligibility. Either you can call or your patient can call directly to get screened and schedule the treatment. And um, Otherwise, if you are interested in becoming offering this treatment um, at your facility, we certainly encourage that if it makes sense for your patient population. Um, then, uh, you know, here are some links and resources to uh, figure out how to learn how to order and what kind of resources you would need at your site to get started. And next slide. And I just also wanted to point out to a couple new resources that we have. Um, we sent out through the City Health Information Network a couple weeks ago um, a detailed guidance um, on the updates that we reviewed today, um, and that can be accessed on our uh, provider webpage under the monoclonal antibody tab. Um, and we also have uh, a patient handout resource um, that you know has common uh, patient information and FAQs on there um, that can be handed um, to your patients as you talk to them about this therapy. And um, Translations of this document um, should now be up on our website as well. Next slide. And so, you know, I think the most important points today are that, you know, we would consider monoclonal antibodies, especially now. Uh, we still have ongoing transmission. Um, we are seeing, you know, we still have a significant uh, portion of our population that remains unvaccinated and vulnerable. Um, so this is still a very important tool to prevent progression to severe COVID in our high-risk patients. Um, and it's really important that we um, continue to work to ensure access for our communities um, and patients that are uh, most at risk um, and impacted by COVID-19. Um, and, you know, really start thinking about how uh, you can integrate post-exposure prophylaxis therapy for your patients, either through offering it yourself um, or um, referring your high-risk patients. Um, and really, I think if, if you take anything away from this, um, it's really the most important takeaway is, is really time is of the essence. So if you can even talk to your high-risk patients, you know, before they get sick to counsel them so they are aware of the treatment. And I think it's really important just to let them know, you know, if they do get sick, there is a treatment that they can, you know, pursue and receive. And so it's incredibly important that if they develop symptoms uh, or have a high risk exposure that they um, get tested for COVID-19 um, and talk to you or, or contact, um, you know, the treatment sites you have decided to refer patients to, to make sure that they get treatment as quickly as possible. Um, and I think that is it for um, this section. And I, we may have a few minutes left for Q&A. Okay. Uh, thanks, and thanks, uh, Dr. Zucker and Dr. Foot for your excellent presentations. Um, we have a few recurrent questions in the Q and A, and I think for um, either Dr. Zucker or Dr. Foot, we've gotten uh, several questions around 
monoclonal ant antibodies and vaccination. Um, I think one of the ones that we've been seeing a lot is, let's say you get your first dose of the vaccine in a two dose series, and then you get COVID. Um, you know, should you get monoclonal antibodies? Does that impact your vaccination schedule? Um, please go ahead. Yes. So, um, so just to, to reiterate, um, we that um, if somebody does receive monoclonal antibodies, um, then the recommendation is to wait 90 days before um, starting a vaccination series or um, giving the second dose um, in a two dose series. Um, and I don't know if Dr. Zucker has anything to add. Oh, you're on mute. I'll just remind people that in fact, monoclonal antibodies may be important thinking about the group of immunocompromised patients who may not respond even to three doses of vaccine. You know, that's a group at high risk for complications from COVID-19 and you would you would want to treat them with monoclonal antibodies. Yeah, and, and you did a great job laying out, you know, who those patients that are most at risk. So thank you. And I think just to follow up there, there were questions about like, let's say that you do have a person who could benefit clinically from monoclonal antibody treatment. Uh, would that treatment ever invalidate the previous dose of the vaccine, so they might need another one. No. no. So go, the golden rules, gen, oh, I guess there are some exceptions for transplant, but we don't, we almost never restart the vaccine series over again. Um, and again, if there's a gap in your first dose to your second dose, whether it's monoclonal antibodies or other reason, you just give that second dose, you never have to restart the vaccine series. Great. And um, just a note, we had we had a couple questions about um, vaccines for uh, kids at 12 years old and under 12 years old. Um, I think that Alex Oaken uh, cited some um, information about cons consent and assent that uh, you guys can take a look at, but uh, one of the questions I think pertinent to what you just said is, let's say a parent, um, you know, lied or misled the provider about their child's age and um, got their child the first of a multiple dose vaccine um, while they were under 12. Uh, what's the policy to deal with that? You know, I would, um, the vaccine, I would just say the short answer, one, okay, short answer is a vaccine dose would be considered valid, and we would just complete the series. We wouldn't, we wouldn't restart the series once the person turned, you know, turned 12. I mean, I would just not encourage it. You know, the dose that they're testing for children under 12 is lower. I think it's 10, you know, we give for Pfizer, for example, it's 30 micrograms. They're giving 10 micrograms for children six to 11, and it's three micrograms, I think, for under five. So we're talking about giving a younger child a, a much larger dose than may end up being recommended, and we don't have the sort of safety data yet. So I would um, really strongly discourage that. Okay, great. Um... I think, uh, Dr. Zucker, we had a question about the CIR and um, whether DOHMH uh, school health staff are allowed to look at CIR to obtain uh, teachers' vaccination. Yeah, the, yeah, the school nurses um, have can look up the student immunization records, but not the teachers. So in terms of the teachers being required to be vaccinated by September 27th, DOE has a portal where the teachers are supposed to be uploading their uh, vaccination information. So the school and DOE has another way, you know, to know what the uh, vaccination status is of any of the personnel working, working um, at a school. Okay, great. And we'll do one last quick question for Dr. Zucker. Um, should a person with active Bell's palsy get vaccinated or delay their vaccination until um, the Bell's palsy has resolved? Yeah, so there is guidance that is in the clinical 
you know, considerations. Um, and, you know, that could be a discussion with, with the patient. I mean, in general, we would vaccinate. It's a clinical decision whether or not you want, for any vaccine, we always say, if someone has a moderate or severe illness, you wait, you know, until it, it's over, you know, and they're, they're better before they vaccinate them. Um, so I think I would look, refer to the clinical guidance, you know, and it also is a risk benefit ratio. If you want, you want to give vaccine now what their risk is of exposure and risk of getting COVID. All right, great. And that brings us to just after two o'clock, just as a reminder for everyone, the, uh, the slides and a video of the presentation will be available shortly after we finish uh, on the webinar section of our provider webpage. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Have a great weekend.